Top Med Talk. Well, hello, I'm Desiree Chapel, and this is Top Med Talk. We are here in Orlando, Florida for Anesthesiology 2019, the annual meeting of the American Society of Anesthesiologists. With over 14,000 delegates, this is the largest gathering of anesthesiologists and anesthesia providers in the world. Now, I'm joined by my co-host this morning, Saul Aronson, Professor of Anesthesia at Duke. Good morning, Saul. Good morning, Desiree. What a pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to be here. Well, Top Men Talk is here for its third year. This year in the trade exhibition, we're at booth 730. We want to graciously thank our sponsors this year for uh, the booth. It's Edwards Life Sciences. Now, they are right across the aisle at booth 727. So please be sure and stop by at both of our booths, 730 and 727, to say hello. We'd also like to thank the ASA for the support of Top Med Talk during the meeting this weekend. We really appreciate the engagement and desire to share knowledge uh, with the world and everything that we're going to be talking about. Now, I want to introduce our first guest today. We're going to be talking um, about prehabilitation, and we have Professor Mike Grocott, who is actually a friend of the family on Top Med Talk. Morning, Desiree. It's great to be here. Um, how's Orlando been for you so far? All good. Enjoyed the ASA meeting yesterday. Yeah. Uh, good turnout. Lots of interesting discussion. A bit bit sadder about sending off the kids to uh, to <laughs> Disney today while I come in here and, <laughs> and work hard. But I'll, I'll do it. Work hard that. and stay dry. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> I, I hope they brought their umbrellas. Yeah, they're, they're not going to stay dry. <laughs> oh, man. Well, Mike, kind of jumping right into the topic of conversation this morning. Prehabilitation is kind of the word of the year, right? We've been talking a lot about this. And I know that we understand fully what prehabilitation is. But for our listeners out there, can you tell them what that what prehabilitation really means in the perioperative space, I guess? Of course. So put very simply, it is preparation for anything bad, um, mm-hmm. of which an operation is a, is a great example. And, and I think the perioperative field has really led with this. But it could be for other types of therapy, so chemotherapy, radiotherapy, for example, and typically is made up not of pharmacological interventions, but of behavioral interventions. So, for example, exercise, um, getting rid of bad habits, you Mm. know, no smoking, no drinking. It always intrigues me. The doctor's talking about smoking cessation, but alcohol (laughs) reduction. We don't seem to feel comfortable (laughs) with alcohol cessation, but, you know, um, diet, nutrition, um, obesity, weight loss, uh, and also some... um, Psychological interventions that can go along with that, including behavioral uh, interventions to help with behavioral change. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are major complicated type of, of lifestyle things, really. It's all, all lifestyle-related factors, and seemingly very straightforward. Yeah. You know, it's not that complicated to exercise, but, but actually, as we all know from daily life, it is a bit complicated it to is. go out there and exercise. And, and I think there's this intriguing notion of the, the teachable moment, the fact that in the period of time before... Surgery, or, or, or when, when someone is facing a new diagnosis, for example, a, a cancer diagnosis, they are particularly susceptible to messaging around lifestyle and behavior change. So they may be more likely to give up that bad habit or, or start to exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Well, a lot of people see this around the surgical space. So where do you think this is going? I mean, you said with cancer diagnosis, but just in general. So I get the, the two big and overlapping areas I see at the moment are, are the surgical perioperative mm-hmm. uh, and the cancer. And, and there's been a, a lot of attention on prehabilitation around cancer treatments, um, particularly in the United Kingdom and in uh, Australia. Mm. Uh, and there's an increasing amount of attention, uh, as I say, overlapping with, in the perioperative space uh, internationally. So there are studies, big studies going on in the UK, across Europe. There's a lot of interest in Australia and, in, and increasingly interest in the US as well. Oh, Mike, true. with respect to the growing interest in the U.S. and obviously um, an area that I'm much connected to, speak to me, if you can, about the willingness to accept those recommendations. They're, they're true. The data support it. Um, I have an expression be, between data and change is reality. I'm struggling a little bit with the U.S. audience accepting those laudable recommendations as quickly as I I understand that you have experienced in the U.K., for example. And to that point, let me add one more thing. Is it really sticking that much in the U.K.? Like, what do you think the adoption is there? There's a huge amount of enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are challenges uh, within our system as within any system, both in relation to funding and in relation to the, the simple practicalities of finding the opportunity 
between diagnosis and treatment. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I completely echo your observation yeah. that there does seem to be less traction in the US. There's, there's enthusiasm. There's, there's certainly pockets of expertise. But the, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no national guideline here in the way that there has been in a number of other countries. It's probably easier for you to answer that question well, than well, me. Well, that's your experience, Saul. I, I, you know, I will share my experience, not just anecdote, but actually data. And I struggle with it, too. I mean, on, on, on an emotional, you know, sort of um, what makes sense point of view, I struggle greatly with it because it just isn't easy for me to understand. We have a perioperative smoking cessation clinic, for example, in Duke, in North Carolina, where the incidence of smokers is probably higher than the national average, assuming, that, yeah, of course, the people who want to smoke, uh, stop smoking already have. It's the people who want to but can't that we're, we're sort of confronted with. And, and assuming that they would be ready to embrace the idea of our... In, in actuality, many of them are kind of saying, don't ask me to stop smoking now. I'm about to have surgery. I'm stressed out. Yeah. You know, and there, there's a really interesting sort of cultural, you know, mix to that. Um, and, and then, of course, we have the hurdle of cost and who is responsible for paying that, that it remains to be a barrier in our culture right now. And I think we need to get over that. Yep. I mean, so the, the cost side I find very interesting you know the it, it's harder to see with fee for service how who's going to pay for this you can see with the bundle payments where the incentivization might come in terms of uh, improving outcomes I think your observation about smoking is is intriguing because clearly it, the, you know the, the one response is I want to really get ready for this I want to stop smoking drinking I'm going to exercise right uh, and the other is, I'm, oh, I really... <laughs> <laughs> Not now. Don't ask me to do that now. I, I need it's to like chill the out. most stressed yeah. out yeah. moment. Yeah. Like, I need a yeah. cigarette. <laughs> and and I, we, were, we were really surprised to see that. But that, that so far is our data. And I think it's a very interesting signal. And th- there's been a lot of... Uh, we, the, the broader we as the health profession, yeah. have been pretty strong in the health messaging around, uh, you, you know, you've got cancer. You, you need to rest a bit. You need to go home and, yeah. and relax and de-stress before your surgery right. and and it's only quite recently that i think people have said actually that's a that's a really bad idea right you, right. Ne- you need to get out there you need to get on you know walk get on your bike do, get do whatever this. it is and and that will improve your likelihood of survival yeah i think i think it's foundational i think you i think you hit it on the nail particularly for the culture of the u.s is that it is truly necessary to have a multidisciplinary message to change that paradigm and, and, it, and it has to just be continuously repeated with consistency that um, the way we used to do things was not okay. It didn't make sense. The data do not support it. We need to do things differently. And that has to be a drumbeat that just continuously gets pounded because I think there's leakage in the messaging. And, and I think that there are important cultural differences that if we don't acknowledge, we're going to miss things. One is a straightforward difference between you know, as with many things, the UK sits kind of halfway between Europe and the US. And my anecdotal, but there, I mean, there's data out there. My observation of the US is it's hard to walk places. Yeah. Whereas if you go to Europe, it, it's really easy to walk or cycle. They have, most of the big cities have really big cycle lanes. And, and we, we kind of struggle somewhere in the middle in, in the UK. And the other big factor is, um, is wealth and poverty and socioeconomic deprivation. And, and it, uh, there's an... Uh, unfortunate sad irony that those who are most likely to benefit from this sort of messaging and this sort of intervention are those who are most deprived uh, and those who are most receptive are those who, who, who are most well off uh, and that's that's really challenging it, it, it speaks to a whole nother and my colleague Gina Blitz who works with me at Duke um, speaks to health literacy I love the expression and I think I think you touched on that uh, with that sort of demographic if you will characterization. It's true that there are some people who just don't know um, what's best for them. And, and we're um, needing to f- close those gaps. Yeah, they'll, they'll never hear, and they can't ever hear that message. I mean, they're not put into that position to do that. And there's, there's this notion of, uh, of self-efficacy, which is, yeah. is uh, if you like, your belief in your ability to change what you do. So, uh, you know, I, I believe I can take my diabetic medicines reliably, for example, or I believe that I, before my operation, I can get out there and I can get fitter. And, and that also seems to be, at least to a degree, related to social deprivation. And, and we've, we've seen, um, say, for example, with the surgery school we run in Southampton, uh, we, we 
just submitting a paper, we did some analysis, and, and it is those who are most deprived who are least likely to respond to the invitation to come to surgery school. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike, because I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, you're in this world, you've, you've done a lot with, the pre, with prehabilitation in general, um, but I know at Southampton, this is a program that you guys have put together there. So can you walk us through what something, what, what a prehabilitation program kind of looks like for you guys? So I think it's important to say that there are, uh, there are different levels. So we, we talk about uh, universal, uh, targeted, and specialist levels of intervention. So there are some things that you want everybody to know. Right. Uh, that are base, basic advice around exercise, nutrition, stopping smoking. Uh, and, you know, for example, the WHO guidelines on exercise. You, you'd hope, although uh, I have to say every time I lecture to doctors and ask them to stick their hands up, about 10% of them actually do. But you'd hope that most people would be adherent to the WHO guidelines. Um, oh, Sol says he is. I'm, 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 I'm not even going to be skeptical. <laughs> yeah, um, we and then we get, we get on to... Uh, so Targeted interventions, so you screen, you identify folk who may be particularly at risk in terms of their nutritional status, their exercise status, uh, and offer them something beyond straightforward advice. And then for those who are, who are um, most at risk, really specialist interventions, say, for example, an, an in-hospital training program, certainly initiated in hospital, carefully calibrated to their exercise level and monitored so that it increases as they get fitter. And I, and I think that that uh, sort of three-way categorization is really important because we it, it, we almost certainly can't afford to intervene with everything sure. on everybody, but we also don't need to. Right. So so that framework we find very useful. Uh, everybody gets basic advice. We actually invite everybody who's having major surgery to surgery school, and about uh, approaching two thirds of them will come along. Tell um, us about surgery school. So surgery school is a classroom-based. Uh, group education environment that in addition, so we're, we're all used to this kind of thing uh, or, or, or some preoperative uh, expectation setting and education around enhanced recovery. And what this adds is uh, some behavioral change techniques and some advice about different lifestyle factors. So particularly the ones we've talked about, exercise, nutrition, smoking, alcohol, etc. Uh, and uh, our, the data we have so far suggests that it's, that it's pretty effective. Pe- people uh, are receptive to the message. They like the message. Uh, there is a substantial amount of behaviour change, and in those uh, recognising the biases I've talked about in terms of who comes, but in those patients who come to surgery school, their length of stay is less than those who don't. I, I, so that's very interesting. We we um, have experienced that there's add value, and I guess it's a question of um, you know cost benefit when you personalize, if you will, those messages. So the, the generic you should eat right, exercise, and not smoke is true. And, and, and if somebody didn't know that and it resonates, that's a bingo. But our experience is the stress management nuance, albeit anxiety or depression, the, the functional walking and talking, but stress management nuance or smoking cessation are very personal to the individual that, that's, you know, the, the person who wants to smoke but can't, can't for reasons that are very unique to that person. Um, you know, they, they have an oral fixation. They, you know, they were the one that was hated by their mother. I, whatever, it, whatever. It, but, but, but you, you need, you need to. Wow, you, we're going deep into yeah, soul no, mind but, here. But, but no, no. But it is, it is our experience it's that you need to go to that yeah. level to yeah, really, yeah. truly change that person's behavior. And, and the same is true for, you know, the stress component of. Um, what would portend a adverse outcome as it would be a consequence of the perturbation of surgery or something like that. Um, and, and so we, we've kind of created a program where you, we, we divert them into specialized, if you will, optimization tracks that are, signi- you know... Um, so surgery school is exactly the same. Okay. And this is the universal... Uh, so it's clearly not fully universal because we right. don't get everybody to turn up, but this is a universally offered intervention, which then... Uh, uh, if you like, uh, targets people to particular special interventions. So if they turn up to surgery school, they hear about smoking cessation and they say, actually, I'm a smoker and I, I wouldn't mind taking that on. Right. Uh, then they uh, get enrolled in a smoking okay. cessation program. Got and it. similarly, okay. so it's, so it's, it's your the, front door. It's our front door. Yeah. Um, it's, not, it's not completely successful because we don't get everybody coming right. uh, along to knock on the front door. But about what, what percentage of your patients are you guys getting right now? About two thirds. And, it, and oh, it's okay. slowly increasing. Yeah. Um, I don't know, that, that may be uh, due to enthusiasm of clinicians involved in the pathway, because un- undoubtedly 
it is helpful if your surgeon says you, you've got to go yeah. to surgery school. <laughs> yeah. um, I, some of it, I suspect, is, is word of mouth locally, that pe- people hear that that's part of the deal when you come to Southampton now. Yeah, uh, it, it, It's a cool program, and, and I, I'm sort of drawing analogies to you know, the model that we have at Duke, and, and, and others have created in their own settings. Um, but you almost need to have a funnel where people are forced, for lack of a better word, encouraged strongly to go through that narrow corridor to be, be screened, to, you know, and, and have those opportunities be identified, and then I direct them to whatever pathway and corridor make best sense after that. But you, you need to capture the universe of people who are declared surgical to bring them into that funnel to screen them and, and or educate them or, or just you know, identify that they really are okay and ready for surgery. Yeah. So uh, interesting. So you said declared surgical. One, one of our experiences, so that, that's how, how we work. We, You're going to tell me I should have said contemplation. I, know, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I caught it, you know, as soon as I said it. Yeah, yeah. but, but, the, but, tell, but say but that again, Mike, because people don't a, understand that. So, the nation, so the, uh, all the things we're talking about are good for you, irrespective of whether you're having surgery. They, they are likely to increase your life expectancy and improve right. quality of life. And we very much try and engage we talk about, the, as, you, as you know, the moment of contemplation of surgery, and we try and do some straightforward screening then. They wouldn't come to surgery school unless they are listed, so declared yeah, for surgery. Gotcha. Um, but we're doing the screening and uh, the, some of the targeting. If we get a, a flag for smoking at that point, we can start to uh, mm-hmm. send information about uh, smoking. And interestingly, so uh, it, within the United Kingdom, uh, as it currently is, God knows how it's going to be. But within the United <laughs> yeah. Kingdom, what time uh, is it? Easy, easy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, in Wales, they are very much taking the approach that, that the prehabilitation should be offered ir- irrespective of whether you're actually having surgery. So if you get if you come into the uh, oh. the pipeline, which is I might be having surgery, then you they just send you off anyway uh, for appropriate targeted or specialist interventions on the basis that they're likely to be good for their population generally. I would so, say population so where health. Does that, that line cross from um, highly recommend it to mandate? So I'm, in our country, we can't mandate. We can't make, make people do stuff. But, but so, so I guess I'll ask it in a less uh, crass way. We, we always are balancing the imperative for surgery. And we're talking about elective surgery. Emergencies and urgencies are dealt with emergently and urgently. So within the context of elective surgery, we, we're balancing the imperative for surgery which is often overstated, um, to, to the advantages of, of doing things that could optimize um, the likelihood of a good outcome. And, and, and that's a balance that we deal with every day. That's our practical realities. How strong do we put that pressure on the patient and or the physician, surgeon, and or the hospital to, to tip that scale toward the um, do the right thing because it will, you know, have a consequence of a better outcome for everybody. So if I talk to our context in, in England and the, and the United Kingdom, we, uh, we've had significant political issues around, uh, I, I guess, mandating. So you, mm. so you cannot have your vascular surgery, for example, unless you give up smoking. Now, typically, actually, that wasn't what was going on. It was what the press said was going on. It mm. made the... the front page headlines in the newspaper um, but w- what the uh, local situation was was an encouragement you know it, it, it will be safer if you give up smoking so therefore we advise you to do so and our advice is to delay the operation but we're not going to refuse you the operation and, and I guess there are nuances of uh, communication around uh, you know you can have this operation but honestly in the in the state you currently are in terms of nutritional state physical fitness it's really high risk Yes. If, if you embark on this program, it will be substantially lower risk, we believe. With, with a consequence of cost as well as outcome defined by health. So, so um, who's responsible? We're waxing wing philosophic yes. now. It, it quickly gets to that point. But it's, it, it is a very, very important question that is hard to answer. So I guess, I mean, it's all about alignment of incentives. Yeah. Uh, and, and what you really want is for the physician incentives to be aligned with the patient incentives to be aligned with the system incentives. And some of that is around payment mechanisms. Uh, and, and in fact, I mean, my belief is a lot of that's around 
payment mechanisms. And if you, if you have these kind of capitated systems where the, the, the whole, say, a geographical region, or, or if you like, a virtual geographical region, the, the people who subscribe to a particular system uh, have paid for healthcare there uh, in a type of mutual insurance pool, but where the, where the payment says, uh, so we're going to try and use this money as efficiently as possible. We're going to make decisions that are difficult around balancing vac- vaccines with renal replacement therapy with operations for cancer. And, and therefore, at a system level, we've decided it, 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 it really is in our, all our interests to focus on fitness and diet and try and minimize obesity and try and improve behaviors as best we can. We can't make people do that, but we, we do think investing a substantial effort in doing that and, and maybe incentivizing the patients through reduction in their insurance premium is the way to do that. So, so I like that. Also compensate good behavior. Absolutely. As opposed to um, RVUs, if you will. Um, but, but that's a heavy lift. And we're right now in the real nascent stage of realigning our sense of um, value and, and compensation models. I think there are a couple things that I wanted to ask Mike before we kind of wrap up, because we are going to be having to wrap up soon, is that um, this summer at EBPOM, EBPOM partnered with um, the World Congress of Prehabilitation to put on the third meeting for them, correct? Yep. Uh, first one in Canada in Montreal in 2017, second one in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, Holland in 2018, and then the World Congress came to London to the British Museum in a partnership with EBPOM in 2019, um, and was a was an extraordinary success. We had we had a sellout uh, yeah. three days at the British Museum. Uh, we launched our uh, joint Macmillan Royal College of Anesthetists National Institute for Health Research. Uh, guidelines on prehabilitation for cancer, and we had some some big names in in uh, in the audience for that launch, and some really really moving and compelling patient voices talking to that agenda. Uh, and also launched was the International Prehabilitation Society um, at, at that meeting, which is now uh, taking the responsibility both for the organisation of subsequent meetings and, and building this uh, agenda around the world. So, I, what I can tell you is next year's meeting will be in Barcelona. Great. Uh, around, aligned with, hopefully aligned with the European Society of Anesthetists, Anesthesiologists, uh, towards the end of May, beginning of June, I think it's the 30th of May, 1st, 2nd of June, those kind of dates. And almost certainly it will be in Australia the following year. Mm-hmm. And just possibly it will come to the United States uh, the year after that. So yeah. we're talking 2022. And obviously the detail of that needs to be worked through, but that, that's what we have on the horizon. Yeah, Mike, what, what would you recommend for the anesthesiologist, the perioperative specialist? To, how do you get started? If, you, if you're intrigued about this space and you want to grow competencies, um, what's the roadmap to start? So I think, uh, so the International Society is now out there. I encourage you to sign up. They have a website at International Prehabilitation Society. There is, uh, there are courses, if you go the cardiopulmonary exercise testing route, there are a number of courses uh, started in the UK, now very successful in Australia, also coming to the US. There's been one, uh, as you know, at Duke in the United States. Uh, and, and POETS, so the Perioperative Exercise Testing and Training Society are the group that run those and are closely aligned with the International Prehabilitation Society. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, there's nothing to substitute for linking up with a center that, that's already doing this or has an interest. And there are a number of centers across the U.S. And I think one of the roles of the International Society will be linking people in that way. And there are a number of centers internationally. And I know that we, as well as many others, you know, really welcome folk who are interested in this to come and visit and, and talk about it. In EPOM USA Chicago 2020, September 11, 12, 13. We'll have a workshop in prehabilitation and specifically uh, CPET and, and exercise training. As Fantastic, well. great opportunity. Yeah, and I was just going to say, Saul, you've you've given um, some lectures that are on Top Med Talk that kind of where we were going with that conversation. Talk lend lend itself to that, so um, you can look up, you know, Saul Aronson, the the chats that you've had, Mike. I think we talked about this before on on uh, Top Med Talk as well. So topmedtalk.com, you can find uh, all different kinds of conversations and lectures uh, about. Um, you know, where we're going with population health and, and, and prehabilitation and all those different things. So lots of great resources. Mike, thank you so much for sitting down with us and talking the world of prehab. So Lee Fleischer said it um, this past summer at the World Congress. He said um, that prehabilitation is going to be the word of the year. 
right, of 2020, the word of the year, but that we know that it will definitely take, like it will be solidified whenever it stops auto-correcting. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's going to re- take a while. To rehabilitation. Dri- <laughs> I write this word a lot and it I drives tweet- me mad. <laughs> so I tweeted to you this morning. I saw, I saw. <laughs> All right, well, thanks again. Um, hopefully we can chat uh, again more, more about prehabilitation because as we know, we can... Uh, get uh, talk all day about it actually Desiree, so, thank you it's been a real pleasure thank yeah you. well enjoy uh, orlando hope you get out there with the kids and it's not raining and uh saul we're gonna we'll be back later today right always uh, um mike what a pleasure good to see yeah. you again likewise thanks. good to talk to you Saul. well everybody thanks for listening again please subscribe to top med talk you can go on topmedtalk.com to do that you're going to enter to win our bespoke beautiful marshall amp which everybody wants but can't have unless you sign up um, and as well as signing up for our new box sets, our curated compilation, Editor's Top Picks and the Perioperative Coach Series. So thanks for listening. Join us on the, the live Twitter feeds today, and uh, we'll catch you later today. Thanks for, thanks for listening. Cheers. Top Med Talk. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. That's www.topmedtalk.com.